Termo to Madeline, Audio Edition, page 79, chapter, titled, The Corporation. The true name of the Corporation Ranch was the Modoc Land and Livestock Company. It was officially incorporated at Alturas on April 11, 1887, by George Bailey and Willie Nelson. It had been in the process of putting it together since the previous December. Now it was official and it would go by the name of the Corporation Ranch at South Fork for many, many years. And Bailey's land at Madeline Creek would always be referred to as being owned by the Corporation. This was not the first corporation that George Bailey had been responsible for forming. As early as 1885, he and others of his family had formed the George H. Bailey Stock Raising Company. The Modoc Land and Livestock Company, however, was a stronger organization in both capital and livestock as well as in land. George Bailey put up 11,184 acres, including 2,240 acres on Madeline Creek. 3,321 cattle, and 456 horses. Willie Nelson invested 2,100 acres, some of which was in the Tule Lake area. 2,300 head of cattle and 500 horses in the partnership. Then there were two gentlemen from San Francisco, Peter Dean and Thomas V. O'Brien, and another fellow from Marysville by the name of N. D. Combs, who put up thousands of dollars in capital. Willie Nelson became the director and managing agent of the corporation, since he was the only one of the partners who lived at South Fork full-time in those years. He was George Bailey's brother-in-law, having married his sister, Belly, or Bella Bailey. She had died young, though. Willie Nelson and his second wife, Katie, had two children, John and Mary. Under Nelson's direction, the Modoc Land and Livestock Company boomed for about eight years. The Depression of 1890s hit the corporation hard, however, and it never fully recovered. In 1909, George Bailey reconstructed the Modoc Land and Livestock Company. This time, he took in as his partners George W. Mapes, W. O. H. Martin, M. E. Ward, and C. T. Bender, all of Reno. Eventually, with the death of George H. Bailey, this corporation sold to Dean Duke and later to Frank MacArthur. But the name Corporation stayed on, and up until recently, the property had likely was still known as the Corporation Ranch. Not until so recently, but for many years, the Madeline Creek, or Bailey Creek, property was still referred to as the Corporation Outfit. The next chapter, titled Settlement in the Late Eighties. The latter part of the 1880s saw the first surge in settlement in the Tule Lake area. Previous settlement had been sparse and almost strictly range livestock operators. This early settlement had taken up most of the land with perpetual streams and irrigation water. About the only farming the early ranchers did was to cut the natural hay that grew there. There was nomadic types who, although they generally had a central location to call home, spent most of their time covering the vast rangelands of the area on horseback in search of the best feed for their livestock. Now a new breed of rancher was entering the plains. Although they all had their horses and range cattle, which required unnumbered hours of buckarooing, and at times it would seem the making any decision between them and their predecessors is pointless, they all seemed to be somewhat more homebodies. Generally, they were more along the lines of farmers rather than ranchers and could have been considered a precursor to the homesteaders who were to follow. They were not large 
operators and did not buy up boundless tracts of land from the government. They homesteaded their 160s and had m members of their families homestead more ground. Sometimes they bought a neighboring homesteader out when he had decided the Madeline Plains was not for him. Generally, they made their holdings into smaller, family-sized, independent units. Sometimes, running a few cattle and horses, they farmed a little rye and wheat. They usually had a few chickens and a hog or two, and often milked a few cows. Unlike the average homesteader of later years, they almost always built a large and spacious house for their families and equally commodious barns, corrals, and outbuildings for their livestock and they most always worked out part-time, away from home at whatever they were skilled at, teaming, buckarooing, surveying, carpentry, or most any job that could be found on the sparse job market of the Madeline Plains. There were many, many of them, but only the most stalwart stayed any length of time and made a lasting impression. Next chapter, Time titled Anderson. Albert Anderson was only on the Madeline Plains with his family for around ten years. He had a wife and children, but the names of all of them, with the exception of the two children, Ray and Irene, seemed to have been lost to the memories of the old-timers over the many years. Men's names appeared on deeds and in voters' registries, but women and children generally were not recorded anywhere unless they died. So, the author apologizes for not having Mrs. Anderson's name. The Anderson's family came in 1888 or 1889 to the west side and homesteaded at the mouth of the canyon about halfway between the Williams Place and Nine Mile Point. Anderson Mountain and Anderson Canyon leading up to the Spooner Place are named for them, and the oldest of the old-timers have vague recollections concerning things their parents spoke about the Anderson family. Evidently, it only took Albert about ten years to decide that he could find greener pastures elsewhere, as he soon sold out to Mahala Shumway, wife of Benjamin Shumway of Horse Lake, in 1898 and left the Madeline Plains. Next chapter, Metcalf. Ike, Ike Metcalf came down to Susanville from Portland, Oregon. He built and ran a saloon in Susanville before moving on to the Plains. He met Levi and Naomi Conklin of Dry Valley sometime prior to the move and married their daughter, Mary, in 1886. He filed on a piece of ground adjoining his parent-in-laws in Dry Valley in 1887. Later, he and his wife bought the Cole Homestead on the Madeline Plains on the east side of Dry Valley Ridge. There, they built a large two-story house with seven bedrooms and a large living room, dining room, and kitchen. They had four sons of their own, Levi, George, Carl, and Otis, and later they adopted a daughter, Alice Huntington when she was just a baby. When Mary's mother, Naomi Conklin, died in November 1896, Levi Conklin came to live with them also. They ran some horses and cattle and milked a few dairy cows, supplying butter for themselves and their neighbors. And Ike was a carpenter. He taught his boys the trade, and they, were, they built buildings all around the west side of the Madeline Plains and Dry Valley. They built an enormous new house for John Williams, on the Williams Ranch in June of 1901, which is still used today. Next chapter titled Pino. Austin Whitford Pino was a French of French descent, the original spelling of his name being rendered Pinault, P-I-N-N-E-A-U-L-T. He probably came to the Madeline Plains before his marriage to Mary Ellen Batman in 1885. At any rate, they lived on a homestead against the hills adjoining Elmer Van Loan to the north. They were not there long, however, selling out to Van Loan in the summer of 1889. At that time, Austin took up a desert homestead just a mile and a half north of where the town of Madeline is now situated, toward Sage Hen Flat. 
He, too, had a large home and a large family. They were six Pino children, Webster, Eline, Mary, Cyrus, Oscar, and Helen. Austin made a living mainly from running horses and milking cows. When the town of Madeline sprang into existence, he supplied the entire town with butter for a good many years. He also drove freight teams at times when some of the local freighters were short-handed. Austin's wife Mary was one of the more refined ladies on the plains. A terrific manager, midwife, and home nurse, loved by everyone who knew her. She delivered many a babies born in the area before the turn of the century. Her interest in children did not stop at birth, and she did as much to educate the local youth as most of the teachers that came to the plains. Children who came to their, her home were taught to sew and make candy and play the piano. They all loved her, even though she was a strict disciplined and always saw that they dressed nicely and acted properly around adults. Some of the children on the Madeline Plains, like their parents, were a little rough around the edges, but they watched their language closely around Miss Pino. Next chapter, Swain. John Oliver Swain was strictly a stockman. He ran cattle and horses on the place just a couple of miles due east of Bailey Creek. He was born in McNary County, Tennessee in 1862, but came to the Madeline Plains after spending a few years in Texas in 1887. He took up a homestead and bought another 160. There, near Bailey Creek, from a fellow by the name of McCulloch, his brother Alvin came shortly after and took up a homestead on the Butte West of where Termo is today. Later their parents, William and Sarah Swain, came and took up land too. Another brother, Henry Swain, also took up a homestead, but John was the only one to stay on the Madeline Plains. There was, at this time, a family named Blair from Fremont County, Iowa, living in the Willow Creek Valley with three beautiful daughters, Eleanor, Brynina, and Adelia. In courting these young ladies, the boys on the Madeline Plains were batting a high average and came away with two out of three in 1897. George Marr of Red Rock married Brynina that year, and John Swain married Adelia on May 7, 1897. John and Adelia Swain had four sons, William, Robert, whom John nicknamed Dugan, Albert, nicknamed Abe, Fred, and Roy. Next chapter, titled Whittinger. The Whittingers moved over to the plains from Ash Valley either in the fall of 1888 or spring of 1889. Probably Sample, or Sam Whittinger, as everyone knew him, took up the homestead and started work on it in 88 and then moved his family over in 89. At that time, there were six of them, Sam and his wife, Samantha, and four children. The oldest daughter, Rosa, was ten years old. Then there were two boys, Louis and Clarence. They had one more daughter, Bertha, who was just one year old. Later, Winnie, Verna, and Harold would be born on the place there on the Madeline Plains. Mr. and Mrs. Winnegar and their first two children came west by train to Reno from St. Joseph, Missouri, about 1884. There they bought a wagon and team of horses and went on to Ash Valley. Exactly what or who their connection was in Ash Valley has been lost with time. There was another Winninger, Cash Winninger, in the area, and it is highly possible that there was some relation between the two. At any rate, the Sam Whittingers lived in Ash Valley for the next four years, and so they had two children were born. Upon arrival on the Madeline Plains, Sam built a spacious house for his soon-to-be large family. Corrals and outbuildings were soon constructed, constructed, and one of the largest barns on that side of the plains was built. Sam dug what is probably the deepest hand-dug well on the Madeline Plains, but his patience paid off. He finally hit excellent water. The Whittingers ran lots of cattle, and it was not many years after their arrival that the two older boys were able to help with the buckarooing. 
As usual with that size operation, however, it was necessary for Sam and the boys to work out part-time in order to make ends meet. They were all expert horsemen and worked out at times hauling freight and doing road and other construction work with their horses. When the freight road was pushed through from the new town of Madeline to Surprise Valley, Sam and Lewis were among the force of men with their horses employed in building the route. Next chapter, Tule Lake's First Great Water Squabble. Matt Haley first filed suit against five settlers above him on Cedar Creek on September 5, 1889. They were Ben Woodruff, Ed Bonnyman, Jim and Joan Smith, and a Harrison Smith. It seems they had been using the water of Cedar Creek to irrigate their lands. Their property was repairing to the stream, but Matt Haley figured that since he had used the whole creek before any of them ever came to Tule Lake, he should be entitled to it. They all fought over it for the next four years in court. In the end, the court agreed with Matt Haley, and he was awarded 360 minor inches of water, which, in effect, made him the absolute owner of all the waters of Cedar Creek. Before it was all over, the five defendants had left Tule Lake, and Matt Haley ended up with the most of the property. John and Pamela Smith were the first to leave with their seven children. They had three more sons, William, Thomas, and Grover, than they had before they arrived at Tule Lake. Mrs. Smith did not like living at Tule Lake and had informed her husband that she would not live there any longer. It was just as well because John was involved in another battle with Matt Haley, and Matt was out to get everything he could out of an overdue debt. So the family moved to Likely and bought a ranch for $1,200. John had borrowed 500 from Matt Haley in the summer of 1886 to finance his trip back to Illinois and Missouri. There he had visited his family, and when he returned, he brought his younger sister and niece back with him. He also returned with a fine thoroughbred stallion that he had bought at a fair while he was back there. When the debt came due, John had no cash on hand but was not worried, considering that he was one of the largest horse owners in the entire area. He and Matt Haley had always been the best of friends, and John was sure that he could hold him off until he made a sale of some of his animals. Haley had different ideas about the matter, however, and any appreciation the two men had for each other was soon gone. Haley had the case tried in court, and by early 1893 a verdict had been handed down in his favor. The court soon had an order out for the sheriff of Modoc and Lassen counties to impound 1,500 head of Smith's horses. The race was on to see who could get to the animals first. John and his three oldest son, Art, Dode, and John, were out about every day moving horses around to keep them out of sight of the authorities. Smith had a couple of advantages, though. He knew his horses and the country better than anybody the sheriff's office could find to send out. Besides that, a lot of the horses were branded with Pamela's iron and Art's iron. Haley could not touch these animals, of course. Now, Sheriff Ward did not come out the complete loser, however. He captured 39 head of John's horses and sold them for $372. Then, of course, the Smiths could not hide their land at Tule Lake. It was put up for auction, and Matt Haley bought one 40-acre piece for $5 and a 160-acre piece for $45. So Matt Haley got $372 and 200 acres out of the quarrel. But that was not the end of their problems. There was still the water battle, which had been decided in Haley's favor. In February of 1892, he had been granted 200 inches of water. He was not satisfied with that decision, however, and appealed it, obtaining another trial. 
This trial was started in Susanville on July 19, 1893, and lasted six days. David Raker and Charles Hilton of Susanville and Ulti McCabe, Matt's nephew, had ridden all over the north part of the country serving subpoenas and summons on people. John Dorsey, Frank Thomas, and W.D. Meeker were all brought down to Susanville to testify for Matt Haley. They were paid $2 a day for attendance at court and 25 cents a mile for travel expenses by the county of Lassen. In the end, Haley again came out the winner, this time with 360 inches of water. Court costs were levied at $178.35 to be divvied equally between the five defendants. All of them were barred from ever using water from Cedar Creek again, even though some of them did not even own land there at this time. Ed Bonnyman and Harris Smith were stockmen from Surprise Valley. Smith had already returned out of the country, but Bonnyman was cornered and had to pay his share of the cost. Ben Woodruff ended up losing his property on Cedar Creek, but maintained ownership of some land in Clarks Valley. He moved to Likely, partly to maintain his courtship with John Smith's daughter, Maddie, who by the time was 18 years old. Woodruff lost out there too, however, when Maddie found a man she liked better. John Smith ended up selling his property at Tule Lake also, to pay for his share of the expenses. He and John Smith were both living at South Fork at this time, and John had already disposed of any other property he had at Tule Lake. He and Matt Haley were definitely not bosom buddies, but this late date, so the race was on again. One man trying to get all he could, and the other trying to prevent him from getting anything. Again, neither man came out the complete loser. Matt had his eyes on the thoroughbred stallions and that John had brought back from Missouri and managed to get a court order out to impound and sell it. John and his older sons managed to keep it hidden in various neighbors' barns until the heat was off. Finally, C.B. Parker, the sheriff of Modoc County, managed to catch another of John's stallions. This was a beautiful bay horse with a black mane and tail and a spot on his forehead. Sheriff Parker threw a set of John's single harnesses on him, hitched him up to one of John's carts, and drove him to Alturas, and auctioned him off the entire outfit. Haley got the money, but Smith kept the prize stallion. All right, next chapter, titled The Winter of 1889. Page 88.